Stop two of our journey of ideas brings us to Drayton House around the mid 1800s. While here we will look at the beginnings of what would go on to become one of the oldest economics departments in the world, discuss some revolutionary economics and dig deeper into the history of the university. It was here long long ago in 1828 that the Chair of Political Economy at UCL was established, creating what would eventually become the UCL Economics Department. This is the same foundation year as the Cambridge Economics Department, it is the same year as the election of just the seventh US president, and it is before slavery was abolished in Britain and before Germany and Italy even existed. This plaque on the front of Drayton House honours the memory of David Ricardo and shows the department's foundation year. It was unveiled in 2005 by Nobel laureate Thomas Sargent. In England at the time, politics were just as liberal as at our last stop, but by now economics too were becoming liberal. And this was due in no small part to Ricardo and other economists we will be meeting today. While we all know Ricardo as an economist, he started out making tons of money on the London Stock Exchange. His father set him down the path of banking at the young age of 14, meaning that by his 20s Ricardo was sitting on enough of a fortune to completely leave that career and instead do whatever he wanted. He even had enough money to, as it turns out, literally live like royalty in a country estate that is now a residence of Princess Anne. Whether it was innate talent or his regal lifestyle, we'll never know, but either way he produced some revolutionary economics, such as his idea of comparative advantage. Comparative advantage says, do what you do best and import the rest. When each country focuses on what it's best at, we can all globally produce more and consume more. You can see this in action by looking at the back of an iPhone. Engraved here is, designed by Apple in California, and assembled in China. Apple is focusing on what it does best in America, the design, and outsourcing the rest. This was quite the revolution at a time when people really believed that trade was worthless to an economy. Ricardo bought himself a seat in Parliament in 1819 and used it to put his economics into practice, most notably when he fought against the protectionist corn laws. Throughout his life and lasting until modern day, Ricardo's revolutionary economics and his contribution to Victorian globalisation has earned him a reputation as one of Britain's best economists. Who was also in and around Bloomsbury in the 1800s was a UCL alumnus, Walter Badgett. You may recognise this name. As the man who made The Economist what it is today, there remains a column named after him in every single issue of the magazine published to this day. An impressive educational record, Badgett got a first in his maths degree and obtained a master's in moral philosophy, both at UCL. In 1851, he stirred up some controversy when he wrote in support of a French coup d'etat. This attention led him into his career in journalism. Just 10 years later, he was put in charge of The Economist and he spent the next 16 years transforming it into one of the most influential publications in the world. Badgett's influence during his lifetime is not to be underestimated. Another leading journalist of the time, E.D.J. Wilson, is quoted by The Economist in calling Badgett an unofficial member of every cabinet, conservative as well as liberal. Lastly, William Stanley Jevons, a UCL student and professor, pioneered a turning point in economics called the Marginalist Revolution. Before Jevons, we believed that the prices of goods were decided by how much it cost to produce them. But Jevons pointed out that prices of things were also influenced by how much people were willing to pay for them. That is to say that people who buy goods influence the price of those goods as much as the people who sell them. The marginalist revolution was a radical way of looking at things that changed economics forever. To end, we will take a peek inside Drayton House at some of the affairs of the time. Britain was becoming more and more globalised, opening up trade and becoming the workshop of the world. A regretful aspect of this was the colonial East India Company, which as a civil service employing graduates at the time, found its way into the corridors of UCL. Students could come to UCL and study to be selected for the East India Company, taking exams in law, history of India, political economy, and a language of India of their choice. What is interesting to note is that in preparation for their work in India, political economy was weighted equally to history of India and was weighted more heavily than their studies in the languages of India. While the department was training students to work for the EIC, the Professor of Political Economy John Elliot Cairns published The Slave Power in 1862 to make the economic case against slavery. His economic arguments are widely accredited with helping gain British support for the Union in the American Civil War. Behind the doors of our location today was a mixed history, with the author of progressive works that denounced slavery 
training students to work for the East India Company. It's undeniable that Drayton House was the setting for a dynamic period in the university's history. And this was only scratching the surface of all that was going on on the Bloomsbury campus at this time. There's a mixed history of this location during the 1800s, with connections to the East India Company, as well as some of the most accomplished people of the time. All in all, this was a tumultuous time that left the university with a double-sided history, including many incredible achievements and an impressive legacy.